That's our transformation rule. So I'm going to pick up one factor of A for each vector. So this is equal to epsilon I1, I2, I3, A I1, J1, A I2, J2, A I3, J3. And now let's put the three vectors in. U, J1, V, J2, W, J3. Sorry, I can do that. Factor of two? <laughs> okay. So what would I like this to be equal to? That's okay? Let's say uh, J1, J2, J3, U, J1, V, J2, W, J3, okay? If that's going to be true, what I want is I want this coefficient to be equal to that there. So the condition that I'm actually asking for is epsilon J1, J2, J3 has to be equal to epsilon I1, I2, I3, A, I1, J1, A, I2, J2, A, I3, J3. So that's what I would like to happen. The next step of the argument is I said, okay, so this side is certainly anti-symmetric when I swap J1, J2, and J3. So I better check that this side is anti-symmetric when I swap J1 and J2 or J2 and J3 or something like that, okay? So let's check that. That's the first part of the argument. So if I take epsilon I1, I2, I3, <coughs> A I one J one A I two J two A I three J three. This is equal to. First thing that I'm going to do, I'm going to call I two I one, and I'm going to call I one I two. Okay? I can just relabel dummy indices. So this will now be epsilon I two I one I three A I two J one A I one J two a I three J three. And now what I can do is I can swap these two indices. That'll cost me a minus sign. And I can swap these two factors around. They're just numbers. So so you can see if I swap J1 and J2, which is what I've done here, I pick up a minus sign. Okay, you happy with that? So now, all that I have to do is, if this is totally anti-symmetric, it's only going to be non-zero when J1, J2, and J3 each take different values. So I'll give you the value when J1 is equal to 1, J2 is equal to 2, and J3 is equal to 3. Okay? In that case, we have epsilon I1, I2, I3, A, I1, 1, A, I2, 2, A, I3, 3. And this is another way of writing down the determinant of a 3 by 3 matrix. I mean, you, you, in fact, you know that taking a determinant in three dimensions is like taking cross products, right? Which you can do with epsilon. So if you like, these are the rows or columns of the matrix, and we're taking the cross product. Maybe if you think about it like that, you can see the result. So, so then what is this equal to? Well, this is actually equal to the determinant of A times by epsilon J1, J2, J3. So that means I must have the determinant of A equal to plus 1. So I'm now focusing on SOD, only those matrices with determinant equal to plus 1. Okay? So, so requiring these two invariants means I'm left with now just proper rotations. Yes, Noreen? Um, that's one. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could remind us um, the, the two conditions that we went through, two identities we went through, and the one is the square of the other, and the one is the other. Yes. Can you tell us what the three The epsilon is? Okay, so the two conditions that we want to be preserved is we preserve the, the scalar product between any two vectors. Okay, you happy with that? 
And the other one is this contraction of the epsilon with the UV and the W. If you want to know what is the physical interpretation of this thing, this would be the volume traced out by those three vectors. So that's what we're trying to also keep invariant by this transformation. Okay? If you were to um, <coughs> perform a parity, that guy would change sign. Okay? You'd be reversing the orientation of those three vectors. Yep? Sorry, Robert. Perhaps this is a good opportunity to just mm -hmm. Yes. Three, how the S relates or what, what condition Okay. So, so, so that's a good point. So what we've got here is, so let's think about how we're, 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 we're naming these groups. Um, if we have, okay, if we have OD, okay, the O stands for orthogonal. So when we have orthogonal, we mean A transpose A is equal to 1. That's what the O is telling you. The D tells you these are D by D matrices. If you look at SOD, we have the O, so we're still looking at orthogonal matrices. We have the D, they're still D by D, but the S stands for special. You're looking at that subset which has determinant equal to plus one. If you're looking at UN, for example, and you went to SUN, so you've added the S again, you're again saying that you're looking at that set of matrices with determinant equal to plus one. Okay? A any other questions at this point? So these have all been good questions. Okay. So now, the, the, so, so maybe I've got time to do one last thing, which is the following. Let's ask ourselves for um, SOD, what would the generators look like? Well, we would like A transpose A to be equal to plus one. So if we think that we're going to write A is equal to E to the I alpha T, where T is our generator, then we want A transpose, which is E to the I alpha T transpose, to be equal to A to the minus 1, which is E to the minus I alpha T. Okay, so to get the inverse, I just put a minus up front there. If I now compare that to that, I learn that... T transpose must be equal to minus T. Now, these matrices we said were Hermitian. Um, if they are Hermitian and they are anti-symmetric, what do they have to look like? Pure imaginary, right? Anti-symmetric and Hermitian. That's exactly the form that we found over here when we started off by considering a rotation. This was an element of SO2. So what are our generators going to look like in general? In general, we will have a D by D matrix, and we will, we will have, so, so we could have elements like this. So let's say that this is column I, that's column J. This is row I. This is row J. If I put an I sitting over here, I would put a minus I sitting over here, and zeros everywhere else. Um, and then I could take linear combinations of these with any coefficient sitting up there in the exponential to get an element of OD. How many of these generators are there? Well, these have to lie off the diagonal. So if I choose a value for I, and there's D ways to choose the value for I. I must now choose a value for J, which is not equal to I. So there's a total of D minus 1 choices left that I have for my second index. But if I just take this number, I've counted all of those elements above the diagonal as distinct from those below the diagonal. But I have to correlate them with the minus I and the I. They're certainly not independent. So I need to divide by 2. That's the number of generators that we have. Now, if you remember, we said the number of generators would match to the number of parameters that we have to label our transformation. Can anybody tell me how many rotations we have in D dimensions? 
When we have a rotation, what do we do? We rotate in a plane. It's only in three dimensions that we can get fooled into thinking we rotate about an axis. We usually rotate in a plane. So we rotate in the xy plane or the yz plane. How many planes are there in d dimensions? So if I was you and I didn't know, I would guess d times d minus 1 over 2. Right? This is how many planes there are. And let's try to figure out why. To specify a plane, you have to specify two coordinates. So choose your first coordinate. I'm doing the same counting, any one of d. Choose your second coordinate, any one of d minus 1. But the xy plane is the same thing as the yx plane. So I better divide by 2. So this number has come out equal to the number of planes that we have in d dimensions, as it would have to, because that's the number of rotations we would have in d dimensions. Sorry? Sorry, Bob. Oh, could I repeat it? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so, so the fact that our number of generators has come out equal to d times d minus 1 over 2, if you remember, that means that we've got d times d minus 1 over 2 parameters labeling our transformation. And a natural way to understand that is that in d dimensions, we have a total of d times d minus 1 over 2 planes. So it's natural to expect we've got a total, a total of d times d minus 1 over 2 independent rotations that we could perform. So that's where that number's coming from. Okay? Okay. Let's imagine we're working in two dimensions, x and y. How many planes do we have in two dimensions? One, right? So let's plug in a two there. Two times two minus one, that's two times one over two, that's a one. Now let's think in three dimensions. So how many planes do I have in three dimensions? I've either got x, y, x, z, or y, z, total of three planes, right? Sure. So let me make sure. Oh boy, you aren't right-handed, so <laughs> let's just check. Okay, so I'll I'll do this. That's okay. Um, now, how many planes do we have? We've got one plane sitting over here, the the x y plane. We've got a plane sitting over here, um, z y, and we've got a plane over here, z x. Are you happy with that? In general, if I wanted to specify a plane, what would I have to do? I have to specify two coordinate axes. When I want to choose the first coordinate axis in t dimensions, how many choices do I have? D. You happy with that? So I would have a D. And I have to choose a second coordinate axis. Now, I don't have an XX plane, right? I have to choose another coordinate axis. So after I've chosen my first one, I've got D minus one possible choices left. So I'd have that times by d minus 1. But if I count like this, I, I'm going to get it wrong because I'm going to say x times y, which was one of the choices I counted, and then another choice that I counted was y, x. And those are not independent. Those are the same plane. I've only got the x, y plane. And that's why I divide by 2. D does that help? OK. Any other questions? OK, I, I guess this is a good place to stop.